Hello and welcome to day three of the mock trial. Yesterday we heard the plaintiff's case including statements from Ms. Williams' daughter and the plaintiff's expert witness, Dr. Gaynor. Today you will hear the defense case and statements from the defendant, Dr. Lewis, and the defense ED expert witness, Dr. Van Horn. I will now turn it over to Judge Reynolds to begin day three of the mock trial. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm now going to turn you over to counsel. Counsel, would you please call your first witness? The defense now calls Dr. Esther Lewis to the stand. Good afternoon, doctor. Can you tell the jury who are you and what is it that you do for a living? My name is Dr. Esther Lewis and I'm a board certified emergency medicine physician. Doctor, how long have you been in emergency medicine? Just over 20 years. And can you give the jury a flavor of your education and experience in the field of emergency medicine? Yes, ma'am. I received my bachelor's degree from St. Bonaventure University and went to medical school on emergency at Buffalo, New York, University of Buffalo, and completed my residency um, at the University of Buffalo. Dr. Lewis, why emergency medicine? What drew you to that field? I felt the calling to um, care for patients and their families at some of the most vulnerable times in their lives and it really spoke to me and I find great satisfaction both personally and professionally to do that. And how long have you been caring for patients in the emergency room in Prince George's County? Just over 10 years. Doctor, are you familiar with the standard of care in treating patients with stroke-like symptoms? Yes, ma'am. And have you diagnosed and treated stroke patients before in your practice? Yes, ma'am. How often? Almost daily. And are you familiar with the hospital policy at Prince George's Hospital Center for treating stroke patients? Yes. Dr. Lewis, do you recall treating Ms. Williams? I do. And I kind of want tell the jury as we look at this visual timeline together, tell the jury what you recall about your care of Ms. Williams that day. I recall that she arrived at about 9.30 in the morning uh, with complaints of a rapid heart rate, uh, dizziness, um, so it was recognized at that time she was in AFib with a rapid ventricular response and treatment was initiated after I assessed her at approximately 11 o'clock. Doctor, were you concerned for a stroke at this time? No, her neuro exam was normal at the time. Okay. And then what did you do? Um, so, you know, neuro exam was normal approximate to the time of 11 o'clock, 11.10. Um, she began treatment with medications to address her heart rate. Um, I reevaluated her about 12.40, um, added a second medication to address her heart rate, and continued to care for her and monitor her atrial fib. At some point, Dr. Lewis, did Ms. Williams' condition change? It did. Uh, nursing made me aware at approximately 2 o'clock that they had seen some like droopiness to her face. Upon hearing that, I went directly to the room to assess the patient myself, and I appreciated similar weakness in her face. Um, so I called a code stroke, ordered a stat head CT, and started down the stroke process. Did you also request a neuro neurology consult? Yep, that is part and parcel of calling a code stroke. And why did you do that? Why did you call neurology? They're the experts. They are the ones who provide us the directed care for our stroke patients. And you indicated that you ordered a head CT stat. Uh, what were the results of that study? Uh, that CT was negative for any bleeding inside the brain. And when you called neurology, Dr. Lewis, what did they recommend to you in terms of radiologic imaging? They recommended an MRI to further evaluate um, any issues that might be going on within the brain. And we know that the results of the MRI came back at about 441. And um, what did you learn at that time, doctor? Um, that the patient needed some further workup because I provided the results to the neurologist and they said we needed further workup for that, but said to admit the patient and you know continue to care. And did you do that? Did you follow neurology's recommendations? I did. I called the ICU to have the patient admitted for care in, in our intensive care unit. Do you recall what Miss Williams' condition was at that time? 
She was getting worse. She was now obtunded. Uh, she couldn't sit up on her own. Her speech was slurred, and she was unable to follow any commands that we asked of her. And given her condition, did you actually go above and beyond what neurology recommended that you do for Ms. Williams? I did. I did. I thought based on her de rapid deterioration and the, res and the MRI results, I thought she needed transfer to a higher level of care. So I started by calling the University of Maryland Medical Center, discussing the case. Uh, she wasn't accepted at the time, but they re requested we get a CTA. So we ordered the CTA, and that was probably about 5 o'clock. Um, and as we were continuing th through the care and I wanted to get the patient transferred as expeditiously as possible, I contacted other locations. I contacted Washington Hospital Center at about 6 o'clock. Um, about 6.15, University of Maryland still hadn't accepted the patient because we were waiting on the CTA. Called Baltimore Washington Medical Center at about 7.15, 7.17. Um, still with the results of waiting for the results of the CTA, but really trying to get her out of our facility someplace that could do some uh, higher level of care for our patient. Dr. Lewis, the jury's seen the medical records and they see that you called University of Maryland Medical Systems. That's in the records. Did you document these other attempts to get her transferred? Unfortunately, I did not. I was consumed with providing care for this very sick patient. And you testified that you ordered a CTA, and those results came back at about 7.30. Yes, um, what did you do at that point? Well, the results were significant. She had a 10 millimeter basal artery clot. Um, upon getting those results, I called the University of Maryland Medical Center, discussed the results of the CTA. Fortunately, they had a bed and accepted the patient in transfer. Um, so knowing the sensitivity and the finite time we have to care for these patients and get them to definitive care we requested the transfer be done by a helicopter and helicopter transport was requested and as we were waiting for that her condition had deteriorated so much that she required intubation uh, prior to transfer to the university of maryland medical center after that time did you have any further contact with miss williams or her family no i did not Dr. Lewis, we know that at University of Maryland, they were unable to retrieve that clot, and Ms. Williams sadly died. And this jury's heard a lot that there's time is brain. Do you agree with that statement? Yes, I do. Did you delay in your care of Ms. Williams in any way? No, I did not. There's a criticism of you in this case that you didn't call a code stroke immediately when you evaluated Ms. Williams upon presentation. Why didn't you call a code stroke that day? Upon my assessment of the patient, there were no clinical indications that the patient was experiencing a stroke. We've heard from Ms. Williams' daughter, the plaintiff in this case, and she testified that you weren't taking her mom seriously. Do you agree with that statement? No, I do not. I take all of my patients seriously. And, and at that time, Dr. Lewis, was Ms. Williams evaluated for stroke? At the time her condition changed, she was absolutely assessed for a stroke at 2 o'clock. And at some point, do you believe Ms. Williams to have a stroke? Yes, when I assessed her at 2 o'clock, appreciating her clinical signs and symptoms. And did you delay her care at that time? No, ma'am. Are you familiar with your hospital policy as to the appropriate window to transfer a stroke patient for treatment when necessary? Yes, I am. And if we could show that policy to the jury. There's a line in here, Dr. Lewis, and it says that the transfer procedures should be urgently initiated with a goal of patient arrival at the receiving facility within six hours from last seen well. We've heard from the plaintiff's experts, Dr. Gaynor, that that transfer window starts when Ms. Williams presented at 9.30 a.m. Do you agree with that? No, I do not agree. Why not? She wasn't experiencing any clinical symptoms of stroke at the time, and I feel when her condition changed at 2 o'clock, that's when the time should start to effectuate the transfer. 
And Dr. Lewis, did you comply with the policy in working to get her transferred as soon as possible? Yes. I want to ask you a little bit about basilar artery occlusions, which is the clot that Ms. Williams had. Have you seen patients with a basilar artery occlusion before? Yes, I have. How often? It's a rare finding. Are you familiar as an emergency medicine physician with the outcomes associated with those types of clots? Yes, they're often deadly. Looking back, doctor, is there anything that you believe you could have done differently in caring for Ms. Williams? I'm sorry that Ms. Williams suffered a debilitating stroke and so sorry for her family. Um, I can't imagine how hard it is. But even looking back and, and knowing the end of Ms. Williams' care, I don't believe there was anything I could have done differently or would do differently in the future to transfer her sooner. Thank you for your testimony, doctor. Opposing counsel may have some questions. Dr. Lewis, nice to see you again. I just have a few questions if you don't mind. You say you remember caring for Ms. Williams. Is, is that true? Yes, sir. You remember my client lying in bed that day, waiting and waiting and waiting for somebody to transfer her to a hospital where she could get the care. Is that what you told this jury? No, sir. While she was waiting for care, waiting to be transferred, what were you doing to help her? I was providing the necessary medical care and working diligently to effectuate her transfer to a higher level of care. And by the time that occurred, it was too late, wasn't it? I don't believe so, sir. Right. Now, Dr. Lewis, can we agree that dizziness can be a sign of stroke? Yes, I heard that, but I would disagree. Well, can we agree that dizziness can be a sign of, a, in fact, a basilar artery occlusion, a, a, a clot in the back of the brain? It could be, sir, yes. Okay. And do you uh, teach residents that come through the hospital that you need to rule out the catastrophic? Yes, sir, I do. Okay. And did you do that for poor Miss Williams at 930 in the morning when she said she was dizzy and you just told us that that was a sign or symptom of a basilar artery stroke. The patient had other symptoms going on. She had a rapid heart rate, which can account for her dizziness. Um, she was demonstrated to have been in atrial fibrillation with a rapid rate, and that's what was causing her dizziness. She had no other physiologic signs that would indicate a stroke. Now, at 2 o'clock, we can agree that she had clinical signs of a stroke. Yes, sir, I would agree. Okay. And under the policy of your hospital, she was supposed to be arriving, I mean getting there, within six hours. It says the goal is six hours. It's not an absolute. Maybe not an absolute, but don't you think that's a proper goal to have? Absolutely. And I was calling every hospital that had embolectomy, embolectomy abilities in order to effectuate the transfer. Yeah, I understand what you're saying, but if we look at the medical records, you only called two hospitals. Unfortunately, I did not document that. I will own that, but I was working diligently to have her transferred as quickly as possible, all the while providing care for a very sick patient. I see. Now, when you transferred Ms. Williams to University of Maryland Medical Center, did you follow up there with uh, her care? I was led to understand the embolectomy was unsuccessful, and she ultimately succumbed to her injuries. Well, tell the jury, if you would, ma'am, doctor, excuse me, did you ever reach out to Layla Williams, the daughter that you met that day? Did you ever reach out to her and say to her, I am so sorry about the loss of your mom? Did you ever take the time to do that? No, sir, I did not. Would that have been important to you? As if I was a family member, yes, it would have been. That's all the questions I have. Thank you. At this time, the defense calls Dr. Michelle Van Horn to the stand. Good morning, Dr. Van Horn. Can you please state your full name and occupation? Good morning. My name is Dr. Michelle Van Horn, and I am the Chair of Emergency Medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston, Massachusetts. 
Dr. Van Horn, I have a copy of your CV here, and if we could pull that up for the jury to see. And it looks like a pretty extensive CV. Can you just tell the jury briefly about your educational background and experience in the field of emergency medicine? Certainly. Uh, I obtained my medical degree at Wayne State University. Followed by that, I went to residency for emergency medicine at the University of Illinois. I went to earn on a Master of Public Health at University of Illinois School of Public Health in Chicago, and then a master's degree at Harvard University. I've been practicing emergency medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Boston uh, for the past 15 years, and I'm currently in the position of chair of emergency medicine. And in that role, Dr. Van Horn, have you had experience with stroke patients in your practice? Yes. Uh, I've had multiple experiences with patients who have stroke presenting symptoms, and many times uh, I've, I've treated those patients, and I'm well-versed in the practices of stroke assessment and protocols. And I understand, Dr. Van Horn, that you have been offered and admitted as an expert in the field of emergency medicine in numerous uh, courts across this country. And I would like to turn your attention now um, to this case. Dr. Van Horn, at my request, did you um, review materials about Ms. Williams and her care at Prince George's Hospital Center? Yes, I reviewed the record in its entirety. Okay, and what other materials did you review in preparation for, for your testimony today? I also looked at the stroke proto protocols for the hospital, their policies, um, as well as that uh, testimony from Dr. Lewis, from the earlier testimony, and uh, as I said, the medical record. And you were present in the courtroom for Dr. Lewis's testimony yes, earlier today. Yes. And in doing so, did you develop opinions about Dr. Lewis's care of Ms. Williams, which you hold to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes, I have. And if we could pull up the timeline for the jury, please. Dr. Van Horn, the jury's heard a lot about Ms. Williams' presentation to Prince George's Hospital on June 20th of 2020 and Dr. Williams' care of her. And you were here for Dr. Lewis's testimony that day. I want to bring your attention now to the earlier hours of that presentation, before the 2 p.m. time frame. In your opinion, Dr. Van Horn, was that appropriate care? Yes, it was appropriate care. Why? Tell the jury why. Well, the patient presented at 9.30 in the morning, and the major complaint was rapid heartbeat with dizziness. Uh, she was assessed, and EKG confirmed that she had AFib with RVR. At that time, the treatment was uh, cardizem and metoprolol medication, which was administered, and, and monitoring of the patient. Uh, she, yeah, so 9.30, I think that her presentation, based on her presentation, that she was treated appropriately. And did... Ms. Williams undergo any stroke assessments during that time frame? Yes, she actually underwent several neuro exams during that time frame uh, by both Dr. Lewis and the nursing staff, and all were negative for stroke symptoms and signs. And was that all appropriate care? Absolutely. Dr. Gaynor testified yesterday that there was a failure to recognize signs of stroke when Ms. Williams presented at 9.30, given her complaints of dizziness. Do you agree with that assessment? Well, no, because dizziness actually would be a symptom of the presenting concern that she had with the, the AFib and the RVR. That would be a sign and symptom of that. So at that time, they shouldn't have been really looking f to rule out stroke at that time, but they did do neurological exams to make sure that she was normal. Okay. And in all fairness, Dr. Van Horn, can dizziness be a symptom of a posterior stroke? Yes, it can be a symptom, among other symptoms. And do you call code stroke, Dr. Van Horn, on any patient that presents to your emergency room with dizziness alone? No, a code stroke would not be initiated just for the symptom of dizziness. This jury's heard that there was a change in condition at approximately 2 p.m. where Ms. Williams experienced some facial weakness on the left side. Is that significant to your opinions? Yes, facial droopiness or weakness on one side of the face would actually be an ind indication of stroke that you would want to investigate further. And was that the first sign of a stroke in this case? Yes. And what was Dr. Lewis's response to that? Dr. Lewis called a code stroke when he first saw the indication that there might be stroke symptoms presenting, and then they also consulted with a neurologist uh, in addition to studies to further investigate the concerns. And was that all appropriate care? Yes. And was it all timely care? Very timely. 
We know the MRI that was ordered came back at 414 and confirmed a stroke. Uh, what did Dr. Lewis do then? Uh, right at that time, he then called neurology uh, because neurologists are the experts in stroke care and we often look to them in emergency medicine to help guide us with our care and treatment plans. So he called neurology and at that time neurology recommended aspirin and admission to the ICU. And did Dr. Lewis do that? Yes. And did Dr. Lewis actually do more than that? He did. He at that time decided to consult with downtown uh, University of Maryland campus to find out if there was any uh, procedures that could be done that we couldn't provide for the patient or that he couldn't provide for the patient at uh, University of uh, Prince George's Hospital. And was that appropriate? Yes. Knowing that Dr. Lewis um, testified that she called additional centers and that they also did not accept her as a patient, was that also appropriate? Yes. You've, we've heard from Dr. Gaynor this time and time again, this time is brain. Do you agree with that in a general sense? Yes, in a general sense that, that is accurate. At the first signs of stroke, we really need to have a quick intervention in order to minimize the damage to the brain tissue. And in your opinion, Dr. Van Horn, was, doc, was there anything else that Dr. Lewis could have done to speed up the process of getting Ms. Williams transferred? In this situation, Dr. Lewis did all that could be done in order to effectuate a transport. Unfortunately, there were beds that were unavailable at that time, so he was really work she was really working toward uh, that transfer. Dr. Lewis testified that after she called University of Maryland, she actually called three or four other centers as potential backups. Now, we know that's not documented in the records. Um, and Dr. Gaynor testified that if it isn't written down, it didn't happen. Is that true? In a sense, people like to say that that is how it occurs because in, in hindsight, in review of the record, that's how we formulate the, the care that was given to the patient. However, in this situation with a code stroke and a very busy emergency department, it would be difficult uh, to, to document every single intervention that was completed for the patient, and the patient's care is our utmost concern. The fact that there are um, no notations in the record of these three other centers, is that a breach in the standard of care? No, that alone wouldn't be a breach in the standard of care. It, it was attempted, uh, and unfortunately, it didn't get documented in the medical record. I'd also like to ask you just a few questions about the policy that Dr. Gaynor testified to. If we could pull that up. Dr. Gaynor testified earlier about this policy at Prince George's Hospital Center. And the jury's heard from her that Dr. Lewis failed to meet her own hospital policy in relation to the six hour transfer window. And according to Dr. Gaynor, this transfer window began at 9.30 a.m. Do you agree with that? I do not agree with that. Why not? Because when the patient uh, showed up to the facility at 9.30 in the morning, uh, there were no stroke symptoms that were appreciated at that time. And the transfer time should have begun when the patients started demonstrating these stroke-like symptoms, which would have been around 2 p.m. Okay. Dr. Van Horn, even if we start that clock at 2 p.m., the jury's heard that Ms. Williams didn't get to University of Maryland until approximately 9.30 p.m. Is Dr. Gaynor right? Did, did Dr. Lewis violate her own hospital policies here? No. The policy itself says that they are urgently initiated with a goal of patient arrival, and that was definitely Dr. Lewis's goal, to get the patient out as quickly as possible. And they began that transfer initiation as soon as the stroke symptoms were appreciated and the need for a higher level of care was appreciated as well. In sum, Dr. Van Horn, all the care that Dr. Lewis provided to Ms. Williams, was it appropriate and within the standard of care? Yes. We know Dr. Ms. Williams was transferred at approximately 9.30 for endovascular clot retrieval, which was sadly unsuccessful. Plaintiffs claim that this was due to Dr. Lewis's care and the delay in getting her that treatment. Do you agree with that? No. Why not? A basal or clot is a devastating injury, and very rarely do patients make recovery from such a devastating injury. So in this situation, it was unfortunate, but 
an event that occurred because of the patient's underlying medical condition. Are you familiar, Dr. Van Horn, with the general outcomes associated with basal artery occlusions? I am. And what are they? Uh, it, the outcome is, is very rarely a good outcome. Uh, they, they may or may not recover, but it, it would be in uh, extenuating circumstances. In your opinion, was Miss Williams' unfortunate death due to any of the care no. provided by Dr. Lewis? No, it was not. Dr. Van Horn, are all of your opinions today to a reasonable degree of medical certainty? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Van Horn. I have no further questions. Opposing counsel may. Thank you. Dr. Van Horn, nice to see you again. Uh, we've had the pleasure of meeting on multiple occasions, have we not? Yes. And every time that I speak with you, you're in the state of Maryland to tell a jury that the doctor didn't do anything wrong. Isn't that true? Yes. Tell the jury, if you would, doctor, how many times have you come into this state and testified that a doctor did anything wrong? I have not. And every time you come into this state, you're paid for your time to say the doctor didn't do anything wrong. Isn't that true? I'm paid as an expert witness on the evaluation of the medical care that I review. Do you not appreciate the irony that every time you're here, you're always saying the same thing? No malpractice, no malpractice. Do you appreciate that? My review is based on what I see in the medical record. I see. Well, let me ask you this, Dr. Van Horn. You train residents, do you not, at Brigham and Women's? Yes, I do. Okay. Do you train your residents that a, a patient that's 64 years old, new onset of dizziness is no big deal? I don't think any presenting symptoms are no big deal. I take a look at every single symptom and the patient in whole, and then I'll go from there. And can we agree that dizziness, and you certainly would train your residents, that dizziness can be a sign of stroke? Dizziness can be one of the signs of stroke, yes. And you also teach them that you need to rule out the catastrophic when you have a presentation of a patient in the emergency room, don't you? We also have to look at the patient as a whole when they come in, what other symptoms might be presenting. And we certainly would do a neurological evaluation as part of the evaluation for anyone who presents with dizziness, yes. And tell the jury, if you would, if you don't appreciate the signs and symptoms of a stroke timely, what can happen to the patient? If you, if you don't appreciate the signs and symptoms of a stroke, then you would likely have to... Uh, do some sort of an intervention uh, to help to make the patient whole. And if you don't appreciate the signs and symptoms of a stroke, you can have further damage to the brain tissue, correct? That's true. And I said to this jury in opening statement, there's a phrase <clears throat> that's used and it says, time is brain. Is that something you teach to your residents? That is one thing that we teach to our residents and that's important to know because we have to make sure that we have an accurate early diagnosis uh, of a situation such as that. Let me ask you this, Dr. Uh, Van Horn. Would it have been a breach of the standard of care to have ordered an MRI or a CT earlier that day? There was no indication to order a CT or an MRI based on the patient's presentation and with the corresponding uh, information with the EKG. And I'm certain you're aware, because you told us you've read uh, Dr. Gaynor's deposition, she disagrees with that. Can we, are you aware of that? I am aware she disagrees. Now, you told this jury that uh, the basal artery uh, clots uh, are challenging and patients often don't do well. True? That's true. Okay. But some patients that get timely care and have the clot retrieved can do well. True? Very rarely that occurs, yes. Okay. And Mrs. Williams didn't get that opportunity, did she? She was brought to try and get the clot retrieved and, and it was unsuccessful. And the longer you wait with the clot in the brain, the harder it is to get out. Isn't that true? I don't know necessarily if that's accurate. 
Uh, Dr. Van Horn, I want to switch gears with you just a minute and talk a little bit about the policy at Prince George's County Hospital. You're familiar with the transfer policy, are you not? Yes. I, yes. Okay. And the policy there is designed to get care for these types of strokes as soon as possible, right? That's correct. And this policy says the goal is to have the patient arrive at the receiving facility within six hours from last seen well, correct? That is the goal, yes. Okay. We know that the patient did not arrive at University of Maryland Medical Center until 9.30 p.m., correct? That's correct. That's 12 hours after she came to Prince George's County Hospital and Dr. Lewis began to care for her. She arrived about 9.30 a.m. in the morning. She doesn't get to University of Maryland Medical mm -hmm. Center for 12 hours. Can we agree that that's a breach of the policy? No, we can't agree that because the patient wasn't showing signs of stroke until much later in that visit, around 2 p.m. Uh, and also, in the policy, it specifically says, initiated with a goal of the patient arrival at the receiving facility within six hours. And Dr. Lewis worked very diligently to attempt to get the patient transferred. Uh, it was through no fault of her own that there were some problems with that, with beds of bed availability and, and transport actually happening. Well, let me ask you this as I wrap up with you, doctor. If the phone calls had been started in the morning around 10 o'clock a.m. instead of 4 p.m., are you able to tell the jury that beds would not have been available earlier? Do you understand that question? I understand the question, but the patient wasn't showing any signs of stroke at 10 o'clock a.m. They had done neurological evaluations that were completely normal at that time. And so the first signs of stroke began at 2 p.m., and that's when the initiation started. I, I hear you. Did you even understand my question? Yes. Yeah. I have no further questions for you, doctor. Today you heard from Dr. Lewis, the defendant in this case, who cared for Ms. Williams. The plaintiff had criticisms of not following the hospital policy, which said that the patient should be transferred to another hospital within six hours of new symptom onset. Hospital policies established the standards that the hospital has determined to follow in order to promote consistency, quality, and safe patient care. Dr. Lewis was familiar with her hospital policy and worked diligently to get Mrs. Williams transferred as soon as possible. Dr. Lewis stated she contacted six hospitals in an effort to transfer Ms. Williams, but did not document all those attempts. Dr. Lewis noticed that her main concern was caring for Ms. Williams, which led to a lack of documentation. It should always be the goal to follow hospital policy, but there are times where a patient's condition or other factors make it impossible to do so. It is critical to document about those factors when you are unable to meet what has been expressed in policy to record the rationale. As we talked about yesterday, good documentation provides you with a safety net. Speaking to why a certain policy standard was not met shows that you were aware, trying your best, and had a thoughtful reason for taking a different path. Tomorrow is day four, and we will hear closing arguments from the plaintiff and defense.